Hello everyone, let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about prokaryotic cells. Remember the prokaryotes include the bacteria and the archaea. Prokaryotes, if you recall, are single-celled microscopic organisms that lack organelles. The size and shape of prokaryotic cells varies but lacks the real diversity of size and shape that you see among eukaryotic cells. There's a short list of shapes that we see for the prokaryotic cells. These include the caucus, or the plural cocci, the bacillus, or the rod, and the plural of bacillus is bacilli, the coxobacillus, the vibrio or comma shape, the spirillum with its plural spirilla, and the spirochete. On this slide, we can see a drawing of the different shapes of prokaryotic cells. This is a nice drawing because it draws the shapes in their relative size compared to each other. If you look up at the top, you can see a caucus. The caucus is simply a sphere. If you listen to the names of certain bacteria, you can hear the word caucus right in the name. I'm sure you all have heard of Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. Those are two genus names that have the caucus term right in them. That tells us that both Staphylococcus and Streptococcus have the caucus shape. The caucus is the smallest of the prokaryotic cells, and it's generally between 0 0.5 and 2 micrometers in diameter. The coxobacillus is simply an intermediate shape between the coccus and the bacillus or the rod. The bacillus term is the more scientific term for this shape, but in common language, we refer to this elongated shape as a rod. So the coxobacillus shape is something of an oval or you could think of it as a very short and sort of stubby rod. This shape down here, the, the one that looks a little bit like a bent rod, this is more commonly called a comma shape. And we find this shape in one particular genus called Vibrio. And then down at the bottom, you can see the largest two types of prokaryotic cells. You can see the spirillum and the spirochete. Now the size differential that you can see here is not as important as understanding that the real difference is in the number of twists and turns and in the flexibility of this cell. The most spiraled and most flexible cell is the spirochete. An example of a spirochete is the organism called Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. The spirillum, in comparison, has fewer twists and is a less flexible type of cell. For example, the Campylobacter organism. That's an organism that's known to cause some types of food poisoning. Campylobacter is a bacterium that has the spirillum shape. On this slide, we can see some images taken of different shapes of cells. And I want you to notice that some of these are in a particular grouping or a particular arrangement, as well as having a particular shape. If you start at the top left, you can see spherically shaped 
yellow cells. This is an electron micrograph. This was taken with a scanning electron microscope. Now, it's also been colorized, so it's not that this organism is actually yellow. <laughs> that's, that's not real. That's been colorized. But this organism is not only shaped uh, like a caucus, but it also tends to group in these large clusters. So the individual spherical cells tend to cluster together. They're often described as being grape-like uh, clusters. This happens to be an image of Staphylococcus aureus. You may have heard of that bacterium. That can be a, um, a bad pathogen in, um, in humans. Now, right next to it is another caucus. These two look very different in size, but that's not real. That's because we're looking over here at a lower magnification under the scanning electron microscope. So this is an organism called Streptococcus agalacti, another caucus-shaped organism. And I want you to notice here and again up here, see how these cocci are actually grouped together in chains. This looks like one big cluster, but in actuality, it's several chains of cells that are all sort of grouped together. This is characteristic of streptococci, um, the streptococci organism likes to um, arrange itself in long chains. So each one of these spheres is an individual cell, and the cells like to arrange themselves in this type of chain. Over here on the right-hand side, we're looking at an image under a light microscope. This would be a bright field image. The background isn't really white here, but it is definitely brighter than the cells. These cells have been stained very darkly. And I think you can just see that they are rod shaped. These are large rods. This is an organism called Bacillus megatherium. <laughs> it's a good name for this organism, megatherium. These are large bacilli, and they like to line up, again, in chains. That's the arrangement they tend to take on the microscope slide. So here's one cell, and then a second, and then a third, and then a fourth. Four individual bacilli in this long chain. If I go down from this image, I'm looking at an electron microscope image of a Vibrio. So this is that comma shape. You can see that there are these tails coming off of these cells. These are flagella. So Vibrio is um, a motile organism. Um, this happens to be Vibrio cholerae, which is the organism that causes the disease known as cholera. Only Vibrio have this comma shape. So sometimes the shape and the organism have the same name. And then finally, over here, we have a spiral-shaped organism. I think you can just see that. You can just see that this organism is it's helical. It's twisted. This happens to be a spirillum. Now this one looks like it has lots of twists and turns, so you might be um, forgiven for thinking this was a spirochete. But if you look at the other cells on this slide, you can see that they're not nearly as twisted and turning as this one in the center. So this is that spirillum type of shape, helical but not nearly as twisted as a spirochete. Remember, all cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic, have a cell membrane. 
and they have other things in common as well, if you recall from our previous lectures. All cells have a membrane, they have cytoplasm in them, they use DNA as their genetic material, and they contain ribosomes for protein production. Outside of the cell membrane, prokaryotic cells also have one or more layers of additional materials, and we've talked about this just briefly so far. Bacteria, for example, have a layer outside of the membrane called the cell wall. Archaea don't have a cell wall. They instead have a structure called an S layer. Now, outside of a cell wall or an S layer, there can also be additional layers of material. Remember, we said these additional layers are referred to as glycocalyx. And there are two kinds of glycocalyx that you will find around some prokaryotic organisms. There's what we call a capsule and what's called a slime layer. Now remember, while all bacteria have a cell wall and all archaea have an S layer, the glycocalyx varies from species to species. So not all prokaryotes have a glycocalyx. If you look at the glycocalyx underneath the microscope, again, there are two types. The capsule is a very highly organized, very tightly adhered layer of material that sits outside of the cell wall in bacteria. This layer of material is very highly organized and it, it sometimes is actually adhered to the cell wall. The slime layer is very different. The slime layer, like the name suggests, is just a very loosely organized, very diffuse layer of what is best described as slime. It's just a slippery material that is surrounding the cell wall or the S layer. It's very loosely attached. And in fact, it can be lost if the cell comes up against some other material that scrapes at it. The slime layer, unlike the capsule, the slime layer can actually be lost. It can be abraded away. This slide shows us the difference between a capsule and a slime layer under the microscope. Over here on the left-hand side, you can see some bacterial cells. These are actual rod-shaped cells, so there's several of them in a chain here. And this image was taken under a fluorescent microscope. You can see that the field is very dark, and the capsule material has been stained with a fluorescent molecule that gives it this green glowing color. So outside of this rod-shaped cell or these rod-shaped cells, there's a cell membrane and a cell wall, because these are bacteria, but there's also this extra layer of material called a capsule. And you can see that capsules are sort of tightly organized around the cells, and these capsules can sometimes even be adhered to the cell wall. Now, each of these rod-shaped cells has a capsule around it, and when those rod-shaped cells line up like this, as they tend to do, it looks like one giant capsule, <laughs> but it's actually an individual capsule around each one of those cells. Now compare that with the image over here on the right. This image was taken under an electron microscope. It's actually showing a piece of intestine from an animal. So most of what you're looking at, especially over here, is the cells of the intestine. But I want you to focus right in on this area. 
These are several bacterial cells that are surrounded by slime layer. So what's really dark here is the, the interior of the cell and the cell membrane and the cell wall. And then this lightly colored material that has some a little bit of gray specks in it. This is slime layer. I like this image because it reminds us what slime layers do. First of all, notice how wide these layers are and how um, inconsistent that width is as you travel around each of these cells. So it's not highly organized. It's not tightly adhered. It's quite loose and slimy. And what that slime layer does is it allows those cells to stick to the wall of the intestine. In this image, the cavity in the middle of the intestine is over here and over here. And the tissue itself, the wall of the intestine is right here. So these bacteria are actually stuck to the wall of the intestine and the slime layer helps them stay there. Now let's think about the function of some of these external structures. I just mentioned that slime layers help adhere um, cells to surfaces. But it's important for us to know all of the functions that these layers provide for the cell. Remember, for a prokaryote, that single cell is the entire organism. So they are out in the environment and they're exposed to all of the different conditions of the environment every day, even if that environment is the human body. They need protection outside of their membrane. So those layers that we call the cell wall or the S layer in archaea, their primary job is protection. This is a layer that's going to help protect that vulnerable cell from damage or destruction. They also give some support to the cell though. Because the cell wall and the S layer are rigid compared to the cell membrane, they're actually going to support the cell. They're going to help give the cell its shape. But primarily, those structures are helping to protect those cells. And in terms of protection, it's primarily from osmotic forces. We talked about osmosis and how osmosis is a form of diffusion that can sometimes pull water out of a cell or push water into a cell. Now, if enough water is taken out of a cell, a cell is going to sort of collapse on itself and die. And if enough water gets pushed into a cell, that cell is going to swell and swell and eventually rupture. So it's important that these organisms have protection against osmosis. And that's what the cell wall or the S layer are really there to do. The glycocalyx is a little bit different. The glycocalyx, whether it's a capsule or a slime layer, it's also going to protect the cell, but not from osmosis. Instead, the glycocalyx protects from drying out in the environment. And the word we use for that is desiccation. If a prokaryotic cell finds itself in a particularly dry place, the danger is that it too can dry out. It can lose water and of course that would kill a living cell. So one thing the glycocalyx protects from is desiccation. It also protects the cell from the immune system of a host organism, especially the capsule. Not so much the slime layer, but especially the capsule. Remember that your immune system, you as a host organism, your immune system has a job to do. And that job is to identify any other organisms that are inside of you that don't belong there. Your immune system will identify those cells 
and will destroy those cells so that those cells don't harm you. Now, the organisms that live in your intestine, for example, most of them are left alone by the immune system. They're not harmful. In fact, they're primarily beneficial to you. But certain planktonic bacteria, certain free-living bacteria that might get in there might be pathogens. And your immune system has to find those pathogens and destroy them. So through evolution, the pathogens have developed this uh, glycocalyx structure to help them hide. It covers up their identity inside the host organism so the immune system can't find them quite so easily. So that's part of what the glycocalyx is doing. It's protecting the prokaryotic cell. The second thing the glycocalyx does is help those cells attach to surfaces. And again, I just talked about this with the slime layers. Lastly, a glycocalyx is very helpful to any organism that is modal. The glycocalyx is a little bit um, sleek and slippery. And so if you're a modal prokaryotic cell, the glycocalyx is going to help you slip and slide and move through the environment.